David, thank you, and I'm glad you were able to make it without me down there on the front pew helping you. But uh, anyway, you did a great job, and we appreciate you. And thank you so much for all of you being here tonight. And, uh, you know, I mentioned this morning that our attendance was down today, but we already have people that are gone on vacations and summer trips, and we certainly uh, uh, do miss all of those on all of you when you're gone. But uh, it's great to have you tonight. And we appreciate all of you being here. You know, sometimes people say, well, you know, if God's going to judge me by the Bible, uh, then probably my judgment would be less severe if I didn't know it. For John 12, 48 says that for he's going to judge us by every word uh, that we speak. And we're going to be judged by his word. Same passage, John 12, 48. And if that is the case, then we need to become acquainted with it. Uh, I know a lot of times people say, well, you know, I just don't think it's that important for me to know it. God's not going to bring up all that stuff with me. Um, I'm just telling you what the Word of God actually says, and uh, we'll let it lie right there. But in case you didn't know, some people say that, but I, I just didn't know. And, uh, you know, that's kind of a foolish statement. People disobey the laws out of ignorance. Uh, they do. They can be driving down the highway speeding, thinking that the law was uh, okay or that they were driving within the law, but they actually were not. Uh, there are a lot of things that can be said, actually, about disobedience to the law. There are many laws on the book. Matter of fact, back at January the 1st, there were new laws that went into effect in the state of Texas, and many of us have not acquainted ourselves with them. So we have to know the law and follow it. And uh, whether you're aware of it or not really makes no difference. Uh, you know, technology uh, is so advanced, isn't it? Uh, it's simply amazing that we can do what we do in foreign land. It's amazing how we can bring a war that is taking place thousands of miles away and bring it right into our own living room or right to your own phone. And it happens via satellite, doesn't it? Uh, and so it is amazing what can be done and how we can know it. And if we can know all of those things that we talk about via satellite, uh, we know that we can send the gospel around the world via satellite as well. But in spite of all the technology that we have, ignorance continues to increase and has increased at an alarming rate. And the reason I say that, you know, people used to say that folks that were members of the Church of Christ really knew the book. But I wonder how many of us really know the book today. Uh, Jesus said, you are not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. If ignorance is growing in America, I can tell you that it is growing in the church of our Lord Jesus Christ as well. And I think one of the reasons is the fact that people don't study the Bible anymore. And to so say, I just didn't know is really no excuse at all. It is certainly true biblically that ignorance is growing. It did in the days of Jesus. You know... Uh, how many books of the Bible can you name tonight? We're not going around the auditorium here asking everybody to stand up and start and finish, but uh, how many of you could name all the books of the Bible? You know, we say that to all of our young people here, that when they say the books of the Bible, then we give them special notice and recognition here on a Sunday morning, and we do that. Uh, simply because we're so proud of their memory level and what they have been able to do. How many can tell you the books of the Old Testament and the books of the New Testament? How many can name the apostles of Jesus Christ? And I know people say, well, I don't know that it's all that important to know that. Certainly it is. If we're going to be judged by the books of the Bible and we're going to be judged by our knowledge of the Holy Scriptures, 
um, we need to know it. The Bible says we're to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. And all scripture has been given unto us is that which is inspired of God, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. And the Bible says that God has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 2. And uh, so it is important. What is ignorance anyway? You know, people often say that ignorance is bliss, but what is it? Ignorance is the absence or destitution of knowledge. The state of the mind which has not been given to instruction or one that has not been informed concerning the facts. Ignorance may be general or it may be limited to a particular subject. And you remember Will Rogers, the great philosopher who lived many years ago, made the statement that we're all ignorant on different subjects, and I understand that. But when we talk about biblical writ, it's not a thing of which we can be ignorant. We need to study the Bible. We need to read it and then study it. Avail ourselves to the information that is there. The most violent element of our society is, it is true, it is ignorant. <clears throat> it is. Always has been. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 13, the Bible tells us that the authorities of the day of Peter and John perceived that they were ignorant and unlearned men, but they took note that they were with Jesus. Now, they may have not been as schooled in the rabbinical schools of theology, but they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit inspired them with the word of God, and they did write. Peter would later write in that book of 2 Peter chapter 1 that our prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were inspired by the Holy Spirit, so the scripture says. There's actually two kinds of ignorance when you really stop to analyze that word. There is what we call intentional ignorance, and, and this is a big one. And then unintentional ignorance. Let me explain the difference. Intentional ignorance is that which a lot of people are guilty because they know they ought to be reading the word of God. They know they ought to have it in their heart. David said, your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. We need to put the word of God in our heart. And when we intentionally reject that, and don't do it, then it is a violation of God's law. It's a sin, Romans 3.23. But then there is unintentional sin. You didn't intend to sin, but you just simply did it not knowing the word of God. But see, if you knew the word, then you wouldn't be guilty of unintentional sin. But they're both wrong. They are darkened in their mind, Ephesians 4 and 18 says, of some they were alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. Now, he's not talking about being ignorant intellectually of maybe what was going on uh, during the days or what the mores were in society or things of that nature, but they were ignorant of the most important thing. And that was the Holy Scripture. You know, it's always astounded me that sometimes people can quote the Scripture that they don't know. <laughs> uh, I mean, honestly, they give you all kind of statements and say, well, you know, the Bible says, when the Bible doesn't say what they're saying at all. But secondly, what does God say about ignorance? And this is really, really important. In the book of Acts 17, Paul, uh, the apostle, had gone to Athens, Greece. And when he stood there in that Grecian city, here's what happened. Paul walked through Athens. I had a sister that lived in Athens, Greece, for actually about three years. And uh, she told me a lot of the customs uh, of the Athenians. 
And one of them was is that they didn't believe in a divine God like Jehovah God. They believed in a multiplicity of gods. And uh, they had even built monuments to them, to every one of them. And when Paul was making his way through Athens, he saw all these gods or these monuments. And then he saw one that said, to the unknown God. And he rebukes the Athenians and he says, him you ignorantly worship. But then he goes on to say, in the times of this ignorance, God winked at or blinked. You ever wonder what that really meant? In the times of ignorance, God winked at, but now he commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Well, let's, let's go back just a little bit in that chapter. Paul acknowledges this and says, For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Whom, and then he says, Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him I declare unto you they were ignorantly worshiping but then paul goes on to say because he hath appointed a day in which he's going to judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained he says whereof he hath given him assurance and to all men in that he hath raised him from the dead now when you know, and I've read that passage a lot of times. Maybe you have too in Acts chapter 17 about God blinking. What did that really mean? Well, I tried to go back in the Bible and find places maybe where God actually blinked at sin and let it go. Well, over in the book of Numbers 15, 28, Moses writes these words. And he begins to talk about the priest. And he says, and the priest shall make an atonement for the soul that sinneth ignorantly. When he sinneth by ignorance before the Lord to make an atonement for him, and it shall be forgiven him. That's the only passage I could find in the Bible that tells me that God actually blinked. But that is really what it's saying. But Paul is saying also that God doesn't blink anymore. <laughs> in the times of that ignorance, God blinked at. But now he commands all men everywhere to repent. Here's a passage I used this morning in my lesson. I'd like to use it again tonight, 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 7 through 9. Paul says, And you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus Christ shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those that, notice this, two things, know not God. They don't have a knowledge of God. They know not God. And then those that do not obey the gospel of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now get this picture. You cannot obey what you do not know. Think about that. There's no way you could obey God if you didn't know what God expected of you. He's going to take vengeance on those that know not God. And those that don't obey the gospel. We have to continue to live in the presence of God's power. It is there for us, but not in the power of man. One of these days, you and I will be gone. We won't be on the scene anymore. The picture will be gone. You and I will answer for what we have done with the gospel of Jesus Christ our Lord. God doesn't want you to be lost. He doesn't want anybody to be lost. Not willing that any should perish, Peter says, but that all should come to repentance. Listen to Romans 10 and verse 1 through 3. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not, listen, not according to knowledge. That meant they didn't know it. They were zealous about it. We got a lot of religious institutions today that are zealous about what they're doing, but they're not zealous about the right thing. For they, listen to what he says, a continuation. He says, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness 
and going about to establish their, their own righteousness, they have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God, and they are therefore accountable. Don't we have a lot of people today that are going about trying to establish their own righteousness? We got people that disconnect from the church and disconnect from God and say, I have my own God and I'll do my own thing and God's going to be merciful to me in the day of judgment. Is he? Is that what God said or is that what you think? There is no excuse for a person's lack of biblical knowledge. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 13, Paul said, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Don't be ignorant concerning them which are asleep. In other words, about the dead. We have a lot of people that are, are ignorant about what happens concerning the body and the spirit when you die. We have a lot of people that believe that you incarcerate in that coffin your spirit and your spirit stays with your body until the resurrection and God awakens it. Not true. For the Bible says that when we die that our spirit returns unto God who gave it and the body goes back to the dust of the ground from whence it came. Paul said for me to be absent from this body, the real me, is to be present with God. But we got a lot of people that are ignorant of that. We got a lot of people that are ignorant about life and death itself. Some people think that when you die, you're just dead all over. But we know that's an erroneous thought. Even in the Old Testament, God's prophet points out the fact that uh, there were so many people in Hosea's day that were ignorant of God's law. And God says, hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel, for the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. Listen to what he says. Because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. We talk about the internet being the information highway, and it really, really is. But I dare say sometimes people are more concerned about the upcoming election than the elect of God, and that's Christians. Now, I'm not negating or saying that we shouldn't be concerned about the upcoming election. I believe that we all ought to be. And we all ought to vote. That's a God-given opportunity for us to let our voice be heard. But at the same time, we need to know about the elect of God, and that's Christians. That's what he's talking about. And the Bible says that the days of this life will be shortened for the elect's sake. My people are destroyed, he says. Hosea continues. For a lack of knowledge, because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt have no priest, or be no priest, to me. Now, isn't that something? Because we talked about the priests back in the book of Numbers, remember, where God forgave them because they committed what they called sins of ignorance. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, it will also forget thy children and the promises that I made to you. But what if we choose to be ignorant? You pay the price. I, I uh, <clears throat> heard today, and I saw this on television, and I suppose it's true. They were saying that uh, actually there are less people going to universities after high school less now than ever before in our history and you know what that tells me that people don't want to study it tells me that people don't want to learn just keep me ignorant and I'll be happy but that's not true that's not saying everybody has to go to college either I'm not saying that but I'm, what I'm saying statistically if those numbers are down that tells us a lot about this country doesn't it and when we had to shut down for COVID, remember that? For about two years, and our young people had to go to school virtually. We lost a group of young people intellectually because that happened. And that's why, as we as elders said, we would never shut this church down again. It won't happen. 
ignorance, hey, the price is not right. It's not. People pay a high price for their ignorance. And the price that we think we're going to pay is much less in their eyes and not in the eyes of God. Ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance is poverty. Ignorance is devastation. Ignorance is tragedy. Ignorance is illness. And it all stems. All the problems stem from ignorance. You know, if you're sick, and I'm going to tell you folks, I'll be honest with you. I called my friend who's a doctor and asked him to call in something. Well, I realized something was going wrong. I needed medication. I didn't just blow it off and say, well, it'll get better in time. That's what a lot of people do. But it doesn't. You need the medication. And you know what? We need a prescription from the great physician. Who is Jesus? Someone said, if ignorance is bliss, you must be in paradise. Have you ever seen people like that? <laughs> I have. Despite what you've been told, ignorance is not bliss. And stretching the truth is not going to change the truth at all. And no matter how often you stretch it, truth is truth, and truth does not change. God said in the book of Malachi, I change not. The book of Hebrews 8 and verse 13 says, listen to these words, that Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forever. And in Matthew 23, Jesus said in verse 35, that heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. Peter said, the grass may wither and the flower may fade, but the word of the Lord will abide forever. So if you think education is expensive, we've been hearing a lot about that too, haven't we? Try ignorance. Try making it through life without an education. Someone said, you know what, we're becoming a third world country, a banana republic, simply because we're not educated and we're not knowledgeable as we ought to be. Poverty is a weapon of mass destruction. That's what God said. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. People can't change the truth. We still believe in preaching the truth here, one of the few places. And I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm not trying to be egotistical in saying that. We still believe in preaching the truth. For Jesus said, you'll know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Our young people take what we call the STAR test, or the State of Texas Assessments of Academic Readiness. That's what it is. And our schools spend more time every year making sure that they spend adequate time to make sure that they pass the STAR test instead of really teaching them the fundamentals and the things that they ought to be teaching them in public education. We got to pass that test. And so the majority of their time is spent on trying to pass the test than to pass God's test. God has a star test, too. He's called the bright and the morning star. And his name is Jesus. And to fail the bright and the morning star is a failure of grave proportion. Jesus said, for this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. And everyone who belongs to the truth listens to to my voice. We have to seek the truth. Truth is absolute. You won't find that truth is one day over here and tomorrow it'll be over here or back there somewhere or behind you. Truth is absolute. People keep saying, well, you know, truth is constantly changing, is it? That may be true of some things in our world, but it's certainly not true of God. 
We ought to be a people that are in search of truth. There's a little DVD that we actually advertise on our television program, Give Me the Bible, just simply entitled Searching for Truth. There's not a week that goes by that we don't have someone who requests that particular DVD. People are on a quest for truth. Truth. Sometimes people try to candy coat the Bible message to keep from offending anyone. By the way, that's what got John the Baptist beheaded. That's what got Jesus nailed to the cross. We're not to add to the word of God, nor are we to take away from it. Revelation 21, 18 and following. He that believeth, is what some would say, and erase baptism. He that believeth shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. That's what folks do. They don't teach you the truth. They remove the word baptism. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now that's what God says. And baptism is just simply faith in action. And he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark 16, verse 15 and 16. And he that believeth not shall be condemned. So it wouldn't do you any good to, to just believe, would it? Not if Jesus said it had to be belief and baptism coupled together that result in a direct object here if you're diagramming a sentence. But the direct object is what? Salvation. Salvation. But it's based upon he who believes and is baptized. I've heard people say, oh, well, he was a believer. Well, what does that mean? What does that tell you? The Bible says of even demonic spirits that they believe and tremble in the book of James. And then the question I ask people all the time is, were you scripturally baptized? Were you really? Were you immersed in water? And were you immersed for the right reason and the right purpose? Did you think you were saved before you were baptized? Then you were not baptized for the right reason. Because you're admitting that baptism had nothing to do with your salvation. You were saved back over here when you believed. People ask the question, well, what about the thief on the cross? <laughs> well, if you study the word of God, you know about the thief on the cross. He said, Father, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And do you know that Jesus lived and died right along with the thief on the cross under the old law that did not require baptism. Did you know that? The old law didn't require baptism. That's why a thief on the cross didn't have to be baptized. But isn't it interesting, following all of that, after his crucifixion, when they went into the world and they proclaimed the gospel, they proclaimed this message that Jesus gave. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Why? They lived under a new law. It was called the law of Jesus. As I said this morning, someday you will appear before God. Will you pass the star test? Will you? I hope you all paid your taxes this year. Let's say, for instance, out of ignorance, you did something wrong on that tax return. And you have to file an amended return. And you pay the penalty because of your lack of knowledge concerning that. Is that not right, Sonda? It is right. Are you still responsible even though you didn't know the tax code? Yeah. You sure are. Every one of us. Remember in Acts 17.30 and in the times of ignorance God winked at but now he commands all men everywhere to repent. Ignorance is no excuse. We're still accountable. 
You know, I read not long ago that they have a day in America, I can't remember when it was this year, but it was called the Happy Blame Someone Else Day. And, you know, people go through that. No doubt there'll be people standing before God in judgment placing the blame on someone else. for their willingness to surrender unto Jesus. You'll say it was his fault or her fault, their fault, but not me, because God knows. And you know what? It points to all of us. We're accountable. If you died today or tonight, where would you go? Where would you go? Where you go will be determined by your response to truth. What will be your response as we stand and as we sing?